for this presentation, as I said, we're going to be looking at COVID and really contemplating and thinking about and processing what has happened over this past year and what are our learnings and insights. Presenting, we have from Ellen Horn, who is the director of the Integrated Dual Diagnosis Treatment Program at Ellen Horn, Zoe Endaucio. And we have Brittany Becker, who is the assistant director of clinical services at the dorm. So with that, I am going to turn things over to them. Okay, well, thank you, Amanda, for that introduction. Um, it is an honor to be here um, with you guys and to uh, um, speak on such important topics. Um, everybody can hear me okay? Okay, good, good. Because I, I can't see any faces at this point. So um, I'm traveling blind. Um, so um, I did take a look at the YouTube. So this is my first introduction to the roundtables. And I, I was like, wow, you guys have a kind of a who's who in the private psychiatric world have done these talks. So I do feel uh, honored to be um, invited to do that. Um, so thank you. But before I get started though, I do want to um, say thank you to, there's a lot of people behind the scenes that were very instrumental um, in putting this together. So I do want to say publicly thank you to uh, Meredith and Elizabeth and Melissa and Tracy and Amanda and Aaron. I think I named all of them, but if I missed someone, um, yes. Th so thank you to those folks as well, because uh, they're, they're very instrumental in bringing this all together today. So um, like Amanda said, I am the director of Integrated Dual Diagnosis Treatment at Ellenhorn. So my primary focus, um, my sort of, of my clinical work is on co-occurring uh, disorders. So for this talk, um, I wanna talk a bit about co-occurring disorders and integrated treatment. Uh, that's sort of modality that we use to treat co-occurring disorders in the context of what's going on now, this global pandemic. Uh, and my hope is that um, in talking about it, I can um, raise some curiosities and some questions because I'm gonna sprinkle a little bit of history in there um, the history of what we know about uh, global pandemics, at least on, you know, on this side of the, in the United States. And um, I'm going to also uh, talk a bit about, you know, um, us human beings as social uh, beings with social brains and social nervous systems. Um, so I, I hope that, you know, um, that will resonate with some of you guys uh, today, especially since we're coming from an environment where socialization has become even more and more important. So this first slide actually um, is just, you know, I put, I, put, I put a number of things. Obviously, um, you know, the first point on the slide is, is very serious. Um, but the reason I put this uh, uh, slide uh, together was just to talk about in this past year, all of the things that happened um, that we, we are aware of. And there's a lot of things that are not on that list. But I want you all to think about, you know, the you know the historic sort of lockdown situation we were in, where we were isolating. I want you guys to think about what isolation does, uh, what lockdown does, what um, what sort of uh, a lack of movement does, and then think about clients who have been in treatment facilities, right? Think about clients that you know because they um, you know, have addiction issues. Oftentimes they are on some sort of lockdown or some sort of restricted movement. Um, and then think about this year where we had essentially most things closed down except for grocery stores and liquor stores, which um, that's a whole other topic. Liquor stores are essential businesses. That's a whole other topic. But we had those open. And um, think about what you did in that um, you know, restricted sort of environment and not lockdown to just get by. And um, the reason why I'm saying this is because, you know, oftentimes the things that people who have co-occurring disorders are exhibiting, the behaviors are exhibiting um, in a different context would seem normal, right? So in the context of this global pandemic, um, it's very normal for a lot of people to up the intake of alcohol, for instance, right? Uh, because they're dealing with the stress of lockdown and all these things. and so. My hope is as we go through this uh, presentation, we start to see uh, folks who have co-occurring disorders as actually being 
having more human characteristics um, than um, characteristics that can be edified or uh, pathologized in many ways. Um, okay, next slide, please. All right, so in this, this slide, we're talking a bit about what are some of the uh, effects, and this is what the, the research is showing, the effects of COVID on mental health. Um, so as you see, some of these bubbles are addressing mental health and some of these bubbles are addressing addiction as well. Um, and one, one of the things I wanna kind of draw your eyes to is that there's that bubble on the top left that says, substance use disorders as a risk factor for COVID-19. Very important. Um, and so, We'll, as we go along this talk, I want you to keep in mind about, uh, keep in mind about the science of infection, right? The science of infection, the science of, of um, how viruses work. And um, as we go along, I'll, I will kind of explain a little bit more about what I mean about the science of infection. Uh, but I want you to think about that in relation to the immune system, right? So if we're talking about substance use disorders, um, you know, think about the immune system and think about the science of infection. But um, yeah, so substance use disorders as a risk factor for COVID um, is something that I think most people don't, don't even think about, right? Um, most of us who are therapists have seen the demand and the uptick in, uh, in folks who are, you know, needing our services, um, you know, and I, and I think, you know, that's what the, you know, the survey, the APA survey said there's an increase in remote and out-of-state remote sessions. So people trying to access people in a different state just to get, just to get help um, and things like that. And then on the addiction side, um, you know, the American Medical Association did note that there had been an uptick in opiate overdoses um, due to increase of isolation and obviously economic stress and other mental, uh, exacerbating other mental um, health problems. Um, and so the, this, is, this is sort of the, the backdrop, I think, of, of a lot of um, the mental health issues and, and, and some of what we see in our um, offices. Now, because this is not an interactive thing, I'm much more used to interactive stuff. So um, I'm gonna have to go to the next slide, but if this was, I would say, what are you guys seeing in your offices and things like that? But hopefully this slide really resonates with um, a lot of uh, what you guys are seeing in your programs and and in, in, in your practices as well. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so I wanna talk a little bit uh, more in depth about pandemics and uh, sort of public health crises. There's a lot of research out there that I think quite frankly has been ignored about um, when we're talking about public health uh, crises. And I will loop back to this um, science of infection too, because I think that's a very important thing. Um, so there's a professor out of, um, so I also want to just sort of say, preface this as I'm in Boston. And so a lot of the uh, uh, researchers that I know are also in Boston. So if it seems like there's a very Boston centric uh, 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 emphasis that I, I apologize ahead of time. But there's a researcher out of um, Harvard. Um, her name is uh, Dr. Evelyn Hammond. And she is, uh, she is a professor, uh, she's a historian of science. And when all of this uh, pandemic stuff happened, you know, it's happening, she started to think about, well, what is, what is the ways in which in this country we have dealt with pandemics? And in her research, she went back and was able to find out that, you know, um, from even before this country was, uh, you know, a, a, a country, there has been uh, known health disparities amongst marginalized people, but there has been a specific response in which uh, the public health systems responds to marginalized people during, the public, uh, during a public health crisis or a biological outbreak or a pandemic. So, there's a, so what I'm saying is that there's a historical pattern that's going on in terms of the response to, what's, uh, to public health crises. So if we imagine um, you know, people with mental health um, disorders and we imagine people with addiction disorders as people were having, uh, uh, you know, difficulty with things like social stigma, difficulties like things like getting jobs and getting housing and all these things, you can imagine them as being marginalized. So I want you to keep that in your, your mind when you're thinking about, okay, um, marginalized people and how they're responding to pandemics. So what she, she noted in her research was, was that um, there is, a, there is, a, there is a, a direct connection between 
Uh, and I'll just give you an example. Um, uh, she, uh, by the way, there's a, a good article uh, that came out last year in the New York Times. If you guys ever get a chance to read it, it's called How Racism is Shaping the Coronavirus Pandemic. And in this article, she wrote, essentially, if you look at, for example, after the Civil War, the post-bellum era, uh, when you had these freed, um, formerly enslaved um, Africans who are now essentially uh, like refugees. And you think about um, what happened uh, with that group because they were isolated and the outbreak of smallpox, right? And how disproportionately they were affected with smallpox, even though during that time they had the vaccine and they knew what to do with it. But because they had refugee status, they were isolated from access to treatment, right? And um, as a result, the, it, the infections rate soared in this community. And so the reason why I'm bringing this up is because because of their status as marginalized people, their access to treatment was cut off. Now, go back to, to you know, 2020. What happened to a lot of people who were you know, dealing with addiction and their access to treatment? And I, and I also said, the research said that there was an uptick in opioid overdoses, I'm making these connections. This is very important to make these connections, right? So the idea is that people's health actually deteriorate when we have these crises because marginalized people are treated differently, right? Um, and th the other thing too, sort of that's historical in this country is that there is this, um, uh, almost this epistemological sort of violence that happens when we use scientific research to say that other bodies are different from other bodies, right? And there has been this history in this country of saying that, for instance, um, African-American or black bodies are different from white bodies and therefore they get different care and different treatment, right? And so again, I wanna make that link to people who are dealing with mental health crises and people who are dealing with uh, you know, uh, addiction issues how we treat their bodies, you know, um, it, differently in terms of things like housing and other other things like that. Um, so this slide really sort of talks a lot about this idea that historically there has been a connection between biological crises and healthcare disparities. Um, that most people, um, rather than looking at the individual, we have to look at the context in which that individual is living, right? And and that um, after that smallpox. Uh, sort of um, breakout that I was telling you about post bellum time, it actually forced US government for the first time to have a national conversation about the healthcare of its, of its uh, citizens. And you know, the funny history, uh, well, if, if any of you guys know about public health and you would know that the, there's a special distinction that smallpox has in, when it comes to um, control of infectious diseases. And that distinction is smallpox, smallpox is the only infectious disease that has actually been fully eradicated from humans. The only one. Um, so, uh, you know, th that, that, is, that, is an interesting, that is an interesting thing. So th again, the idea that they had a vaccine, they didn't use it on certain marginalized people, um, that's interesting. Now, let's go back to the science of infection, right? I did mention that. There's another uh, researcher out of, of, of Boston. Um, she's out of um, Northeastern University. Um, her name is Dr. Lisa Feldman Barrett. And she is a psychologist and she's also a neuroscience scientist. And she um, brought up, there was this research that was along, uh, that she, she um, brought up that she, she didn't initially do, but she was citing this research. And this research basically said, um, they had this uh, model where they put people into um, uh, sort of like hotel rooms where they were exposed to uh, a cold virus. And then they looked at what the infections rates were. And what they found was, even though you need to have the virus present in order to be affected, the mere presence of the virus was not a, a, enough of an indicator about who got infected. In fact, what was more of an indicator who got infected were people who were dealing with adverse childhood experiences, stress, um, all these other things that actually affected the immune system, all right? So 
there's research that says that even the infection rates are really, there's a social context to them. And there's a context in which, these, which humans have to be in that impact even the infection rates. So again, I, I know you, some of you may think, well, what is this related with? It's, it's gonna connect, I promise you, it's gonna connect. Uh, I'm trying to paint this picture that you understand that, that um, there's a whole lot of uh, 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 social stuff going on. Okay, I just got the five minute left uh, thing. This is, this is very tragic. All right, let's get to the next slide. <laughs> Um, okay, uh, so really quickly to go through this slide, um, the idea is what are the impacts on co-occurring clients? Well, the forced isolation due to quarantining and waiting to, evac uh, waiting to get vaccinated create more reliance on old behaviors, right? Um, certainly behaviors that people are trying to change. Um, we see that, you know, with the decline of in-person meetings, and um, you know all of that. It, it's become really hard sometimes to gain that trusting relationship that you need to move somebody to a place of change. Um, and don't worry, we'll get to slides later. Let's get to the next slide just because of time. I, I had a feeling this would happen to me. This is what this is what uh, happens. All right. Um, so what are some hurdles that we have um, we have had to deal with? Well, we had to deal with this idea that community integration. Um, has to be and has to look a lot differently, right? Uh, we have to figure out new ways in, to, 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 to meet with people. And, you know, the good thing is that Brittany is going to speak next and she will talk a lot about this stuff. So I don't ne necessarily need to go in detail about this. Can we get to the next slide, please? Okay, so real quick about integrated treatment. Uh, this is the idea that you're treating mental health and addiction at the same time. And you're treating them not only at the same time, but with the same team and at the same location. And um, rather than going into a lot of the research, if you think about um, this idea that in the, in the past, we very much had it separate. There's a guy by the name of uh, Do uh, Dr. Robert Drake, and he's done a lot of research on this. So, um, you know, I, if you guys want to research this, he's done a lot of research. And, and that's why it's now become evidence-based because of all the research they did primarily in the 1980s um, and it's in 1990s. Okay, um, all right, next slide, please. All right, so actually we can skip this slide. This goes a little bit more into the framework of how to do integrations uh, work, but we can skip this and let's get, to the, uh, let's get to the last couple of slides. So this, I feel like this might be a little bit more important. Um, so how do you adapt this framework in the pa in pandemic? One of the things we learned is that uh, social isolation is, can be very, very bad for this population. And so we had to adopt, regardless of what the state regulations are about numbers and things, we had to, we had to think about how do we meet clients in person, uh, regardless of where the numbers are. Because we realized that in-person visits became so important, essential for people in recovery. Um, and so we had to be very creative about outdoor situations, how to make that work. We had to be, um, obviously have a lot of PPE. Uh, we had to, you know, we had to think about all these things to try to, to adapt. Uh, because what we're seeing is that the, the isolation was deadly for this particular population. That's already feeling very much isolated and marginalized. All right, next slide, please. All right, last slide, okay. And then Brittany's up next. Um, so just to recap all of this, uh, I hopefully, and I know I spend a lot of time talking about marginalization and stigma, but hopefully you start to see that uh, a, a group of people who are already marginalized definitely have sort of, you could say, um, disadvantages during a global crisis, right? And as providers and as treaters, we have to do our best to make sure that we are not only aware of those disadvantages, but meet those needs. Uh, of, of those folks and, and be with those folks. Um, and, and, and at the same time, help them um, connect to people and help them still uh, take on uh, work that is meaningful and purposeful, even in the, even in the pandemic. Um, so that, that's the end of my slides. I, I do wanna pass it on to Brittany because I don't wanna steal her time. Um, and Brittany's gonna talk a little bit more in depth about some of these, um, key concepts like isolation and um, you know, connection and things like that. So, thank you. Okay, thank you, Zoe. Um, it, it was 
great. I know that we can talk about this forever. Everybody, just to give you a, a, an understanding of when we met to create this presentation, we probably could have just kept talking for hours and hours because there are so many outcomes of this past year. There are so many different pieces of the puzzle and all of them are equally important. And all of them impacted us as well as our clients directly. And just so much creativity has come out of this and so much education. So, you know, this is definitely not the last of a very long and continuous conversation. Um, so with that, I am going to shift a little bit more into talking about isolation versus connection, control versus lack of control, and how this has really impacted the young people we work with and their families, as well as the things that we're gonna take into the future. And when this is something of the past, hopefully very soon, um, it's something that we've learned from that we have to continue to use this in the day to day. So for the first slide, I want us to take a second, uh, and this might be a trigger warning, to, to take yourself back to uh, about a year ago, a little bit more, when you first started to hear the terms social distancing and quarantine. And if you all could just use the reaction button below. And when you think about the terms social distancing, quarantine, seeing some of these, um, these ads that were coming up, like step up, not out, stay home, don't accidentally kill someone, if, if you had, can really right now think back and feel the feelings of anxiety, um, fear, curiosity, uh, disbelief, use the reaction button and, and raise a hand or use any of the emojis, whatever is easiest for you. Um, I'm going to look around as I see. So again, taking yourself back, thinking about hearing these terms, starting to get anxiety, um, stress, loneliness starts to come up automatically. These were all things that we were going through at the same time as our clients. And that's what I think really makes this whole pandemic and, and um, this conversation, I think, so interesting and different is that this is not a, just a conversation about what have we learned through research. It's what have we also experienced firsthand with our clients. And these types of ads were the first things that people were seeing everywhere on social media around, um, you know, not that many people were leaving their houses, but when they did go outside, they'd see it on posts or billboards or all around. And it wasn't too, um, wasn't too much time that had to go by that we then started to see the next slide. Right, we started to see coupled with those other ones, stay inside, don't go out, don't go visit parents. We also started to see stay social. Um, this social distancing does not equal social isolation. Six ways to protect your mental health during social distancing. There was this huge uprise in now, if we're going to put out these types of ads of stay inside, quarantine, social distance, we need to also look at mental health. And I thought what is so important, what's something that we're going to take into the future, hopefully as a whole society, is that we have to continue the conversation about mental health and wellness. So similar to what we just did before, how many of you, through your raise your hand reactions, how many of you started to see these signs and instantly were like, um, okay, I'm going to do a meditation routine, or I need to set up. I need to set up a social Zoom call with friends, family, coworkers every Thursday, or just I'm automatically started to sense this push towards, I need to do something to help my mental health as well, and really use this time as a way to model for our, our clients as well as, um, you know, our young clients as well as their families. So if you had that reaction, once you started seeing the shift here for yourself, let's see some of those reactions and the emojis as well. Okay, so let's go to the next slide and talk about the data that we saw from social isolation. So the coronavirus pandemic was triggering a loneliness epidemic. Our clients and the people that we serve 
oftentimes are feeling isolated when they first are coming and seeking out treatment. And loneliness has been something that while many of them have been struggling with, this was something that they saw was really on the rise. One of the studies that I was reading about said that 36 uh, percent of respondents to a national survey of approximately 950 Americans reported feeling lonely frequently or almost all the time in the prior four weeks compared to 25 percent who were called experiencing serious issues um, the two months prior. So as they were getting closer and really st the start of this pandemic, you started to see this high level of feeling lonely and 61% of those were aged 18 to 25. So the direct clients in the population that we're working with are really reporting these high levels of loneliness. And we can just imagine, and we can also feel because we were going through it, what loneliness was doing to them as well as us. Um, and then the last piece of data here is that the CDC showed that there were 63% of young people reported experiencing substantial symptoms of anxiety, depression. These are things that we saw that we could imagine, understand that we felt ourselves as well. We can go to the next. So isolation versus connection. This is a time for many of our young adults that we're working with where they're, they're working towards figuring out their identity and moving more towards a chosen family, starting to finally start to become more independent, leaving their family homes, and deciding who, who's part of my inner circle. And this was really in, in, uh, interrupted, whether they were then sent back home and if they weren't living home for many years or they had to leave school and they were back home or they were in their own apartment and now they're by themselves and feeling like they can't leave or can't see other people um, and continue that pattern of developing who this chosen family is. So this creates more loneliness, um, even when they were connecting. Many of my clients were sharing that, yeah, you know, I call so-and-so every single day, we talk about 10 minutes, but it still doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel the same connection. A lot of them also had this urgent feeling of just putting relationships on, on hold. So they were saying after the pandemic, you know, then when I can see them and actually hang out in person, then I'll, I'll, I'll try to make friends instead of just saying, you know, let's, let's continue the relationships right now. There was such a desperate need for connection. And yet for some reason, many of our clients rejected the type of, uh, the type of connection that they had to engage in right now, whether it was through social groups that we had at the dorm or if they had to connect with people that they typically saw in their recovery meetings through Zoom now, but couldn't really talk or have that, that moment where they hung out right before a meeting started, they just rejected that change, right? As a lot of us are comfortable with the change. You can go to the next one. So with that being said, social media, how many of you, and you could see that I'm, I have this pattern here where I liked, I also like, so I like uh, participation. So if you can, raise your hand on this too. How many of you started to feel that for your clients or even for yourselves, that social media wasn't at some places, and we're gonna talk about where it was helpful, but in some other areas, social media wasn't actually as helpful because we started to see not only those ads for how to uh, build your wellness and, and mental health um, in there, but overindulgence and the greater allowance for drinking more, um, engaging in harmful behaviors, um, talking more about, you know, glorifying just being depressed and lonely and not necessarily reaching for help, but, but um, or potentially do, but, but really using that in a way that's just glorifying unhealthy ways rather than helpful. So if you, if you notice that social media or online platforms did that alongside with the helpful stuff, you know, show some reactions. What I found through working throughout this with the clients was that Zoom, of course, was a game changer. This was great. Instagram, especially Instagram stories, a lot of clients felt like they were there with certain people and going through their days with them. And even, you know, celebrities and famous people that they look up to, they were able to see how are they going through their day to day. Um, being able to go into different recovery networks like an AA or an NA meeting 
anywhere in the country that they wouldn't have been able to ever go to and meeting people there or going, I've had, I had clients who said, you know what, I was up at a certain time of the night and I actually joined an AA meeting in Australia. Things like that being available to them in their recovery was awesome. Netflix party, video games. And what we found then on the other side though, that was not so helpful was of course doing any of this in excess, but especially a lot of the clients that I work with shared about Instagram and seeing those stories again of people, you know, they have to stay inside. So they're ordering multiple, multiple bottles of alcohol or they're using other types of substances or they're videoing all of their struggles, which is becoming more of a trigger for them. And also kind of thinking about that for themselves. Let's go to the next one, please. Okay, so control versus lack of control. Of course, throughout the pandemic, when you don't know when there's gonna be a vaccine, when you're gonna see certain people, there's so much uncertainty. We found that there are so many clients seeking out control. How do I gain control or how do I gain a sense of control? In a, a time when there was a change in their routine, their employment or their education um, had to completely change, break in continuity of healthcare or recovery community. And lastly, missing significant life events, whether it was their birthday, it was a graduation, or having to, um, having to go through a funeral of a, of a loved one, unfortunately, to COVID or other types of loss and not be able to be there with their family and having to do certain ceremonies that really bring about peace in the past through Zoom or not really be there at all. So this control versus lack of control conflict, we saw causing many intense emotions and, and heightened the auto, uh, automatic internal thoughts um, leading to a sense of insecurity, more need for control. So then attempts to regain control through further isolation instead of social distancing, isolating, disordered eating patterns, substance use, misuse or stopped use of their medication, self-harm, and it can, the list can go on and on. We can continue. So for our clients specifically that struggle with executive functioning, this made it really hard. Like, like for many of us, and I'm sure I could even speak you know, for myself of talking about what does routine look like? We've been working on routines. We've been working on planning, prioritizing, and all the things that we may have planned for have to be thrown out the window and replanned. All of the routine or the pieces of routine or the accountability that we hope to have gotten through uh, the new routines we were creating had to look differently. The two areas that we found that many of our clients struggled with the most in executive functioning was self-regulation and planning and prioritizing. And a lot of what fell into this is healthy sleep hygiene, um, just decline in overall ADLs in general, and, and really an inability to get out of bed and out of the house. And it, it was understandable because there was so much that was telling them to not do that, right? If we think back to my first slide of all the ads, it was a time where a lot of the clients sometimes felt like, well, maybe this is an excuse now. I'm not alone in, in just wanting to stay in my bed. There's so many other people, whether they identify as having a mental health disorder or not, staying in their bed or not following through certain routines. So I can push that off and it's okay. A lot of clients talked about one part of relief they got from this was that they didn't feel the pressure to now have to actually work on certain goals that we've been pushing them and they've, their families might've been pushing them towards. Um, because everyone else was in the same boat and nothing else can change right now. So I can push that to the side. Um, so for some, there was some relief in having to social distance or quarantine because of how much they struggle in executive functioning skills in general. You go to the next. Eating disorders. So going back to that idea of control versus lack of control and wanting to gain some sense of control um, and especially some sense of control over anxiety and what they were feeling, as well as being in potentially a studio apartment or one bedroom or their family where they're going from their room, their bedroom to the kitchen and then to the living room. There was not much option. We saw that eating disorders really thrived in isolation. So there was a greater degree of uncertainty and anxiety, making it more challenging to maintain healthy eating patterns, 
um, working or studying from home, spending more time in the kitchen, also spending time at home, not going to a grocery store or seeing the certain um, professionals that they need to see as regularly. So not stocking their kitchen appropriately with certain foods, not making those food deliveries. So not having food at all and restricting. So overeating, not eating, not properly stocking kitchen um, versus you know ordering food or cooking, all of these things really started to come up. We can keep going. Okay, and we're almost towards the end. Similar in this, in the same idea with self-harm and safety, what we tended to see is that the first couple of weeks or, or even the first couple of months that we went virtual, a lot of our clients who struggled with self-harm and safety, we had very specific contracts put in place for safety. They were getting check-ins with their, their support team twice a day, and they were feeling pretty secure. But then around like two, three months more into this quarantine, that's when we started to see people struggle even more with, with really managing and maintaining the ongoing intrusive thoughts that they typically would have other outlets of distraction or um, just healthy coping to help manage those thoughts. Also with this being in isolation or quarantine or social distancing, it increased the ability for people who typically might engage in self-harm that would be, we'd be able to see it if we're seeing them in person, they can hide those more easily. So seeing that it was getting harder and harder for them to do something that nobody would really know. Feeling lack of control of things around them caused greater belief in self-harm being something to control emotional states. Okay, and we can go to the next one. So through it all, emerging creativity. This has been really the greatest thing that I've been able to watch and be a part of um, while working at the dorm throughout this whole pandemic is not only to see the creativity that has emerged through leadership and the clinicians, but through the clients. A lot of the clients really have risen to the occasion to say, I got to get back into hobbies. And you know what? I know there was a big bread thing and everybody was making bread. Bread's not make, bread making is not for me, but botany is. Hey, dorm people, can we create a botany club? And so through this pandemic and what we're, we're going to continue to now do as we go forward is keep up with the, the need for outlets, the need for creativity and what we, can, um, what we can encourage our clients to really do to help themselves continue to stay engaged with their life and the things that they really enjoy. Whether we were in a quarantine or social distancing or not, these are things that they can now always engage in and they feel proud of. So some of the things that came through this and then we will be able to wrap up is a peer process group. The clients felt that they really wanted more and more time with their peers to talk about what they're going through and relate and plan what social distancing activities could look like. Botany club, entrepreneurship club, um, yeah, well, employment might look very different right now, but that doesn't mean that takes away from my dreams and aspirations of, um, you know, creating my own business one day. So they started this music club, book club, justice service, service and advocacy club was a really big one that came out of this, especially of the times and what was going on, what still goes on, but what was going on as we're all in quarantine. Um, as far as the eating disorders or dis disordered eating patterns go, we really found this need to have grocery shopping groups. Even if it was online, people getting together and figuring out what's your list look like? What's mine look like? Let's pick a day and we're all gonna order our groceries. Um, cooking group or cooking, and there's, there's fun challenges that they can do, a cycling club, virtual hangouts. Um, and the thing that was so important, and I think is one of the most important of this list was creating weekly community meetings. So that people, no matter what, in the entire community of that we work with, are going to see faces, be able to give each other shout outs and really be there for each other and share creativity through hardship um, weekly and know that they have something to look forward to that they all can show up for. So with all of that said, thank you. And we will move on to the Q&A part. Thank you. Thanks, Zoe. Thanks, Brittany such um i feel like like you guys said at the beginning i mean we could talk for hours and hours and hours about some of the stuff um you know zoe i feel like at um especially in your section you were bringing up so many really just 
critical and crucial issues and one around how, you know, what we know historically and what we're seeing today is that whenever there is some type of a crisis, it is always the most marginalized populations that, that suffer the most. And coronavirus um, is, is, has certainly um, shined a, a even brighter light as if people should even need a brighter light on the fact that, you know, people of color are suffering more so than um, the privileged populations. Uh, and also too, I, I thought, you know, when you were talking about, um, you know, when people are, have pre-existing mental illnesses, they're, they're more susceptible to being impacted by, um, by physical ailments, by this pandemic. Before we get into more of a formal q and I was wondering if you wanted to just um, expand any more on any of that, on, on either of those topics, just because I feel like they're they're so important and it's our responsibility as mental health providers to really not like sidestep those topics and to, to address them head on because as mental health providers, we've been part of the problem for a long time and we need to start really being part of the solution. Yeah, sure, thank you, thank you. And um, I apologize for the, the rushing of the presentation earlier. Um, yes, I think, you know, I think um, this, this concept of, you know, helping professions being injurious to people, um, I think it's an old concept. Um, you know, if you just look at the evolution of addiction treatment, for instance, um, we, you know, we've gone from, you know, at some in, in the 1940s, uh, 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 they were using frontal lobotomy <laughs> for, uh, you know, for some of the treatment. So we've gone from, from very, um, you know, uh, harmful um, ways of trying to treat people to, to now where we're at a place where we're saying, oh, actually, you know, you should integrate the treatment. Oh, actually, you should um, be consumer-based and, 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 and be strength-based and follow what, you know, uh, what the client wants and things like that. However, we're, you know, as society and, and as large, at large, we're still not, we're still not uh, treating this population that we treat um, very well. Um, there's, there's some research out there that says, um, if, they, if you look at, um, this is public health research, if you look at rich countries, and if you look at rich countries that have um, a greater uh, in, in, uh, inequalities in that rich countries, there's actually a higher rate of mental health problems in those countries, even if they have the same amount of money. It's just really the inequalities that make the, that, that big of difference, right? So if you think about things like that, as healthcare providers, how, how I mean, how else are you, you should, you know, um, in terms of thinking about your clients is how else should you address this? You should address about the context in which the, the lives that they live in. Um, and especially for now that everyone's talking about opioids and the opioid epidemic, especially for these clients that, you know, um, are often, uh, you know, not believed when they come, go into emergency rooms. They're often, um, you know, the last people that people think about when there is a global pandemic, you know? Um, you know, well, we have liquor stores open. Well, why couldn't we say that, you know, um, these crucial um, addiction services um, remained open and had full resources available to them, right? Why, why couldn't we make decisions like that? Um, so, you know, I, you know, not to belabor this point, but I, I just think that it's an important piece. And, and, and sometimes that piece means getting outside of the bubble in which we work in and kind of seeing how does the outside world integrate with what we're trying to do. Yeah. Thank you for that, Joy. Any any responses, thoughts, comments on on this topic? I guess, you know, my question and, and just sort of putting this out there to everyone, whether that's Brittany or Zoe or the participants that, that have listened in is, you know, what, what are our commitments like right here in this, in this something, in this room, in this Zoom room, um, you know, moving forward, we've had a year of learning. Um, we've had a year of growing. 
we've had a year of, you know, some painful acceptance of, you know, where our shortcomings are and where we need to do better. Um, like what, what are some commitments that people are willing to make um, to, to, to changing things and, and, and doing things differently moving, moving forward, given all that we've learned in this, in this past year. I just, I'd love to hear what people, if people have reflected upon that. And if, if you haven't, if you, if you could use this as an opportunity to reflect on it. I, I can just add at the risk of talking too much. Uh, you know, I certainly, for me, I, I think certainly um, the importance of, of socialization for me has hit home um, and, and being able to understand, uh, I think I have a better appreciation for what, for instance, when we have clients that are at our residence, what that experience is like. Um, I think I have a greater appreciation for clients that we have to send to a, a detox or send to some place that removes them from their community. What that is like, um, just from go, just from going through this experience, where you know, for for months and months, it was just me and my wife, really. And then you know, um, you know, some of the clients that I would see, and that's it. I was disconnected from family and all these other things. Um, so um, I, I I would say I have a greater appreciation for the for the fact that we are social beings, we have social nervous systems and brains and that we need to feed that. So a greater empathy sort of for what our clients are reporting to us when we say, when we make the referral um, that, that we do believe is clinically indicated and they push back saying, how can you do this to me? You're taking me away from my people. <laughs> and the places that I feel comfortable in my social networks and sending me to the woods or wherever it may be. Doesn't mean necessarily that it's not the right referral, but certainly we can um, approach it with more empathy for that, what that really means for the client. Somebody wrote in, uh, Barbara wrote in the comment section, um, we need healthcare for all, COVID really makes that clear. Um, <laughs> yeah. I think we do. And I think that we in, in this Zoom as mental health providers, it is not only our responsibility to provide sound and ethical and evidence-based clinical treatment, but also to, to, to think at a more macro level and to really advocate for that because there's so many people that we want to have help that we turn away from help or that we have to turn away from help. And that's just, I mean nobody in this country should not be able to get the help that they that they need and that they want. Yeah, I think it's been I think it's been interesting um, in terms of, of the social impact and I, I agree with everything that's been said. Um, you know, I, I think for a lot of our younger generation who are more adept at virtual communication and and have kind of relied on that and you know, when you ask them, like, you know, who are your friends? And they're like, oh, yeah, my five friends are in Japan and Norway and blah, blah, blah. And I've never met them in person, but they're like the most important people in my life. Um, so I think like, like for them, for I guess for me, like dipping my toes into that realm and just relying on Zooms and, and phone calls, um, you know, has been informative for me. Like the fact that it can be meaningful to have those connections virtually while at the same time being so excited to, to have in-person contact, right? And so from an older generation who, who you know, uh, like might not be able to relate as well to those that just rely solely on, on some of their virtual friendships, um, you know, maybe the importance for me is like, you know, wanting to expose them to both um, you know, is, is kind of what, what I've experienced. Like I'm about to see my parents for the first time in a year and a half. And like, I'm giddy, even though I talk to them like daily. Um, and so, yeah, just, just being able to see that difference. And I think I had somewhat of a superficial detox, um, like, you know, those moments where it was like, 
is it really that uncomfortable for me not to be able to go to the mall this weekend? Um, and so like having this experience of like reprioritizing my life in some ways has been, has been nice. I love that, Johnny. It's, it's, um, we've, we've spoken about this a lot, um, as a clinical team, because we're always sort of taking our own pulses as well to just do some self checks and some self care, knowing that we can't help our clients effectively if we're not, you know, taking care of ourselves. And I think one of the silver linings is when there's not so many things to do on a day to day basis outside of work because everything's closed, you know, like your kid doesn't have soccer practice because there's no soccer this year and you don't have to go to this meeting in person because we're not meeting in person this year. There's a lot more time to just move through life in a different type of a manner that maybe isn't as like frenetic and gives you more time to to breathe and assess, well, what do I really need to be doing in my, what do I really want to be doing in my life on a day-to-day -day basis? Do I need to be scheduled every single minute, every single hour, or has it been nice to not have some of these things to go to? And do I need to, in the next year, take things out of my schedule that aren't so necessary? I have a question for the group. Um, one of the things that has come up is, the schools being virtual and the schools now going back to in-person instruction, but leaving open the option of having virtual school. And a significant portion of kids are choosing to avail themselves of that online option. And they've been very happy in their rooms with less social interaction. And now this has become a norm and the schools are all able to accommodate that. And so I wonder about your thoughts about our socialization of, you know, very normal neurotypical kids not then availing themselves of the challenges of going back to in-person instruction. Because as we all know, the, you know, negotiating those, those relationships and, you know, the, the hallways and all of that is in itself as difficult or more difficult than the instruction that they're learning in the classrooms. And the kids have said, hey, I'm done with that. Um, you know, I can, I can get this work done in two hours and not have to go to study hall and not have to go to lunch and not have to go to recess. What are your thoughts about how that might change the character of childhood, of our younger generation and so forth? Do Britt or do Zoe, if you want to take it, if not, I will, whoever wants to take that one. That's a biggie. That, that is a biggie. And I want to preface this by saying I'm not a child psychologist or developmental psychologist, but I, I could, I, I guess the one comment I would make about that is that, um, you know, we, we understand that the science says that, you know, words can change, um, you know, biologically your, your, your makeup, right? Um, and so I think in this virtual world, there's a heavy reliance on words, and there's a whole lot of other aspects of meeting in person that the body takes in the information that uh, we maybe are missing um, in this in this idea that is uh, uh, very virtual. So, you know, if I was to guess that that would have some impact on on um, you know on sort of development over time. However, I, I I do I mean as an addictions person, I'm also noticing that you know for the first time, you know, there's an uptick in screen addiction. <laughs> um, so, you know, from that aspect, there is some definitely some, I think, some effects of being, you know, uh, in, alone in your room and sort of um, being on screen. Um, but yeah, so those are the sort of thoughts I've had about it. Um, I'm not saying it's all, you know, all negative, but there's certain things that um, I think about. Yeah, I think, I mean, certainly for children being, not behind a screen and, and being, school is not just about learning A squared plus B squared equals C squared, right? You're learning social skills, you're learning emotional skills, you're learning interpersonal skills. And, and that needs to happen in the hallways between classes. 
Um, that said, I do think that we have to realize that going to school in person at this point in time in the pandemic is still an issue that, you know, we have to look at privilege. Many communities of colors are, are living in multi-generational homes. There's fears about getting the vaccine, rightful fears, um, and to just negate like those options of doing virtual until we can, you know, help create safety for those populations also, you know, is something that we need to look at as well. But I'm looking at my clock and I want to get everybody out of here with at least a little bit of time before your four o'clock. Um, so we're going to end. But like I said, this is on YouTube. If you want slides, let us know. And we look forward to seeing you on the 22nd, where we'll be, we will be presenting with Lidner Center of Hope, Dr. Tool on co-occurring, so something Zoe that you're <laughs> right up your alley, um, on co-occurring uh, substance use and mental health disorders. So we look forward to seeing you all there and have such a good night and